about how I've monetized my passion in the area of pizza. And pizza, everyone knows, uh, everyone has their own definition of it. So I'm going to describe sort of how my journey has evolved, what the inspiration was of, of why I decided to do it, where I'm at, and in fact, where I'm going. And so early on, I was a kid up in Brooklyn, New York. They've got great pizza up there. My family moved down to Philly. Pizza stinks. Family then moved down to Virginia. Pizza got progressively worse. <laughs> the only good thing about Virginia is that's where I met my lovely wife, Andrea. And uh, then we moved to Florida, and a pizza got even worse than that. So, I, you know, there was a powerful motivating factor for me trying to reverse engineer the pizza of my childhood memory, which was these coal-fired elite pizzas that Patsy's and and Lombardi's used to make. And I set about, as a hobby, making those at home. And one thing led to another, and through my travels in technology services, uh, I began to sit down with these pizzeria owners and find out what made them tick. I would sit on the stoops with the families and understand how they actually got into the business. And what I quickly found out is I could actually make a better pizza at home than they were making in a pizzeria. And I was saying to myself, my gosh, where do I go? What do I do now? I don't have a rudder to, to sort of guide me. And my research indicated that when the Italians began immigrating to, to the U.S. in the late 1800s, early 1900s, those Italians didn't have jobs in the area of pizza. The pizza makers over in Naples, they all had jobs making pizza, so none of those guys immigrated. And, and you know, you can really look this stuff up. Marco Parente, who's a friend of mine, probably knows more about Neapolitans and, and their immigration than anyone. And uh, that's really the basis of my evidence for uh, coming out with that statement. So when I reversed engineered pizza against what I had as my definition for the ultimate pie, I found out there's all kinds of defects. The ingredients stink. The, the flour is, is laced with bromates, which is somewhat carcinogenic. It's outlawed in Europe. It's outlawed in California. It's being used up and down the East Coast, but it's not good for you. However, it was what my definition was. So I sort of looked for, well, where do I go? If New York doesn't have the best pie, maybe I ought to go to Naples and the natal epicenter of the modern pizza. And I began reverse engineering that. And what did I find out when I finally got there? I found out I didn't like it, right? My New York sensibilities told me a pizza needs to be bigger. It needs to not be soupy. You need to be able to pick it up with your hands and eat it. Over there, they take a knife and a fork and you cut it up and, ah, oh, it's just too sterile for me. So what, what I've said about my life doing is taking the best of what New York has to offer, the best of what Naples has to, off, has to offer, and the best of me. And I'm designing from the ground up the perfect pizza. That's my goal. Don't know if I'm going to get there, but I've dedicated the remainder of my life to that. Just so you know, the conversation around the kitchen table with the family when I told them I'm leaving technology services and I'm going to go construct the perfect pizza was really interesting. <laughs> my wife's like, oh, okay. <laughs> um, so when I finally decided to make the leap, it wasn't based on just blind faith. Uh, there's some biblical support for all this. If you were to go to 2 Kings chapter 4, there's this lady in a village who's about to lose everything because uh, she doesn't have any money. Her husband died, and, and back then they didn't have uh, or believe in remarrying. So uh, all she had left was this, like, urn of oil, and it was half used, and she was going to use that for dinner that night. And... And she was talking to this prophet Elijah about, oh, woe is me. I've led a good godly life. Why is this happening to me? And in essence, he said, look around. And uh, that message stuck with me. And elsewhere in the Old Testament, there's this guy standing in the middle of a field. And there's thousands of soldiers getting ready to march on him. And he says, dear God, what have you done to me? You've got me standing out in this field. I have no armor. I have no weapons. I'm about to be killed. Why are you doing this? And God says, look around. And he says, well, there's nothing here but this jawbone of an ass. And God's like, pick it up. And so he picks it up and he slays a thousand Philistines, and that guy's name was Samson. So I had that going for me, God on my side. And then Malcolm Gladwell, hey, he's a, he's a good guy to have on your side. 
Malcolm Gladwell last year came out with a book called Outliers. And in Outliers, he talks about outlier type success, super success in the world. And he takes a look at how the Beatles made success and how Gates and Jobs and all those guys became successful. And the one take home message that I got out of that was, hey, in order to become a master, in order to have a shot at outlier type success, you need 10,000 hours of focused study in your field, your area. It doesn't matter what your field is, whether you're Mozart, whether you're the Beatles, whether you're your jobs or, or whatever. And you also need a little bit of luck. So I began calculating how much time I had spent in pizza. And it turns out it was like 11,382 hours. <laughs> so armed with that knowledge, I went to my family and said, hey, I'm now a master in something. <laughs> And I think I've got a chance at outlier levels of success. So I've gone about making the perfect pizza. And what I want to do is share with you what I think the ultimate standard is. And it, it really starts out with three parts. And one part is the big guy on the left and the knowledge about yeast and, and dough and the fact that you're not trying to make bread. And the second part is how it's actually baked. And then the third part of it is, I think, you know, the toppings that you put on and the combinations and so forth. And so let me talk about wood-fired. That's my oven. I hand-built it. There's only one other in the world like that, and it's sitting on my lanai, which is the oven that I used for years and years and years because I couldn't make the ultimate pie without the ultimate method of, of baking. And the Neapolitans are the ones who really came up with a circular oven with an ultra-low dome that can perfectly bake a pizza in about 30 seconds. The American market really wants a pizza baked in about two minutes because they want a wafer-thin crisp with an open and airy crumb structure uh, supporting cost no object toppings. Americans are topping-centric. Neapolitans, on the other hand, are, are really uh, crust-centric. So I went about the, the process of building you know, the best crust with the best toppings, and, and hopefully that makes the best pizza. And I think it's so important that you know, I name my restaurant after a wood-fired oven. And you know, the long story short is I didn't want to build it, but a Neapolitan wood-burning oven wouldn't hold up in the humidity in, in Tampa, in Florida. It would, you know, you'd have to dry it out for like eight hours before you could actually bake it. And these things bake at like 800 to 1,000 degrees. So I had to find a way of getting the ultimate method of baking pizza and, uh, and do it in a way that the oven wouldn't crack open and cause a fire. So. That's what I've done. I've built my own oven. I've programmed my pizza to be um, a lactic acid flavor profile in a crust, which combines with the lactic acid flavor of my cheese, and it contrasts against the acidic acid tasting tomato. That palate of, or the palate of the Americans, they can get that, and it is an extraordinary product. So having said that, I'm now out of time, and I thank you and I'll take questions later. Thank you, Peter. I, 